In this episode of Mind Pump, the world's top fitness, health, and entertainment podcast, uh, we answer a lot of fitness and health questions that are asked by listeners and viewers just like you guys. How's it going? Um, now, in this episode, we open hey up with an introductory portion. It's 45 minutes long, so we talk about current events and mention studies. After that's when we answer the questions. By the way, if we want to fast forward to your favorite part, just go to mindpumppodcast.com. Uh, that's where we have everything time stamped. But I recommend you listen from beginning to end. That's the way you should digest this Mind is Pump. the way. Now, we open up by talking about uh, Justin's wife's crop top. Yeah. Yes, that's how we opened the episode. Yeah, that's you'll, how we did it. You'll want to hear that part. Then we talk about You're welcome, honey. Uh, how excited I am because uh, I got a baby coming any minute now, literally uh, any minute now. And so we start telling baby stories. Adam talked about the uh, when his wife went into labor uh, a little over a year ago. So good stuff. Then we talked about the podcast that we watched on YouTube, Impact Theory. This is Conversations with Tom Bilyeu. He interviewed Brett Weinstein. Great episode. You guys should go check out Impact Theory, by the way. Tom interviews some really, really good people, does a great job. Yeah, they get into it. It's great. Yeah, you learn some good stuff. So you can find, actually, Tom Bilyeu's uh, podcast and these interviews if you go to Impact Theory with Tom Bilyeu. That's on Apple Podcast, Spotify. There's a lot of other podcast platforms. Or you can go on YouTube and just look up Tom Bilyeu. That's Tom and then B-I-L-Y-E. Uh, you, great interviews, great podcast. Then I talked about a supplement I started messing with called Agmatine. Um, so stay tuned. I'll give my my full synopsis and coming episodes. Uh, we talked about homeschooling challenges, or should I say distance learning challenges. They're not homeschool because they're no. still following the same curriculum. Big difference. Then we talked about old 90s commercials, uh, Herbal Essence. Remember that? When the women oh. would wash their hair and it was a little inappropriate. Yeah. Which led us to talking about uh, one of our new sponsors, Dr. Squatch, they make soaps and shampoos that make you smell good if you're a man. Like you really smell good. like a man. My wife can't keep her hands off me now that I use Dr. Squatch soap on my Ooh, armpits so and other areas. Uh, by the way, because you listen to Mind Pump, you actually get a discount on all of their products. Just go to Dr. Squatch, that's D R S Q U A T C H dot com forward slash Mind Pump, and then use the code Mind Pump for 20% off. Then we talked about wisdom versus knowledge. What's the difference? Which led us to talk about online personal training certifications because if you want to be a really good trainer, knowledge is important, but wisdom is more important. Now, one company, NCI, focuses not just on knowledge, but how to apply it when you train your clients. This is why this is the only certification for trainers we've ever partnered with. We've never partnered with another certification but NCI. And because you listen to Mind Pump, you can get certified at tremendous discount. Just go to ncicertifications.com forward slash mind pump. And then Justin talks about his little wiener dog yeah. and why I won't listen to him. Yeah, Come here, boy. Then we answered the questions. Uh, here's the first question. What, what can you do to get better at the overhead press? So we talk about movements and exercises you could do to improve your overhead press strength. The next question, how do I fix an imbalance between my left and right lat? So in that part of the episode, we talk about imbalances in general and how you develop muscles that seem to be lagging behind others. The next question, what does a, uh, the, a cool down, wh what kind of value does that provide? Why should I do a cool down at the end of my workout? And the final question, this person wants to know, what are good shoes to squat or deadlift in? Also, uh, MAPS Anabolic and the No BS Six Pack Formula, two of our most popular programs, we have combined and we've slashed the price. You can actually get both of them, lifetime access With for, our Gingsu knives. for $59.95. So normally, if you enroll in MAPS Anabolic and the No BS Six Pack Formula, that's $174. Right now, $59.95, lifetime access. Now, MAPS Anabolic is a full body workout program designed to help you build strength muscle, and speed up your metabolism. The No BS Six-Pack Formula is a core training program designed to bring out definition in your abs by building them. Building your abs and your core means that they're more visible at higher body fat percentages. Again, both programs are combined for our MAPS October Super Sale for $59.95. Here's how you sign up. Go to mapsoctober.com. And it's t-shirt time. Ah, shit, Doug. You know it's my favorite time of the week. Whoa. Oh, yes, it is. You got aggressive. Bing, 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 b
We have two winners for Apple Podcasts and two winners for Facebook. The winners for Apple Podcasts are R. Gainan and Article V C O S. For Facebook, we have Mike Norton and Brian Plunkett. Uh, Plunkett. All, all of you are winners. Send a name I just read to iTunes at mindpumpmedia.com. Include your shirt size and your shipping address, and we'll get that shirt right out to you. Justin, I, I, tell me about uh, Courtney's crop top. I see you keep seeing notes about that up on the on the screen. You haven't said anything about it. I'm very curious. I know. Like some the of these story. just like, you know, I, I don't get to them, but uh, it, it was just a funny funny kind of thing that happened at, at home. Like we have we have gear that every now and then uh, Courtney's like, hey, why don't you grab me something from from Mind Pump? Why don't you get why, why don't you go in the back and grab me something? I need something to work out in. And so there was like one of our uh, tank tops. I think Rachel had come up with this design and it's like bright yellow. And mm-hmm. it's like, anyways, it's girls love it, whatever. And so she she had this on and she was working out. She's coming upstairs. And both my my kids like went up to her and were like, Mom, you need to like put something else on. No like, way. You're showing too much skin, Mom. Did they really? They were like shaming her. Like, <laughs> saying she's like too sexy. That's you know? so funny that your, yeah. your boys would say they're so young. I know. And I was like, I don't know where they got that from or anything, but like they're... They're a little, uh, uh, you know, judgmental with that. Pr- protective, yeah, maybe? Yeah, protective. Do you yeah. think kids at that, because they're young, right? You think that they just, they instinctually are like, wait a minute, yeah. more people are going to look at my mom? I don't, I don't know. know. It was people. interesting. Of course, you never want to look at your mom in that life. And don't you it's remember Don't is. you remember the one kid in school who had the your hot mom? Hot, dude. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no. Don't you remember that kid? That kid. I remember that kid in our school. You know, he's had this super yeah. hot mom, and you teased the fuck out of him all the time. <laughs> no, but, you didn't. I didn't yes, think it happened this do. early, though. You know? Do you walk in? On your mom when she's showering all the time. No, <laughs> yeah, dude, that's you, terrible. you totally as a high the, school the kid that was always asking to come over. You yes, know? Was like, yes. Hey, hey, man, your mom makes when great you're a pancakes. Kid, when you're a young boy, you do not want the hot mom. You're proud yeah. of that as an older. Uh, you get True. older, like, oh man, my mom took care of herself. Like that's something you're proud of, right? Like yeah. when you're later in your life. But when you're a young boy growing up, uh, ch- teenage boy, you don't want to have pre- a milf mom. No, no. <laughs> it makes me wonder. Maybe one of his friends like said right. something. Right, yeah. exactly. That's all. Yeah. All it takes is one friend one time to make a comment like mm. that, and you like forever have it. And then you're like, mom, put on some clothes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> wear a longer shirt. We, we have been having more kids over lately that want to stay. Uh, this makes me think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, I hurt my knee. Yeah, <laughs> and Mrs. And Mrs. Andrews. Yeah. Can you, can you k- kiss yeah. my boo boo? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> no, you. Tommy, you're 18. You can take care of your new yourself. <laughs> <laughs> kiss your own boo boo. <laughs> Screw you. Yeah. Yeah. That's hilarious. Did you guys have any teachers growing up that were like that you you thought were just no, oh, was, nodding was off? Was that too obvious? Yeah. Seriously? Like, yes. You did? Yeah. Uh, just one, uh, Miss Bowie. Uh, oh, you said her name. Yeah. Wow. Hey, Miss Bowie. Shout out, Miss Bowie. Out. You, wow. you, you did you it mi- for me when I was a kid. You, you, you missed a great opportunity, yeah. Justin. I loved your eyes. <laughs> I just adored you. And you didn't even know it. <laughs> yeah. I should have showed my true feelings. Yeah, I had a French teacher. She was uh, she was kind of hot, you know, and uh, it's the only reason why I, I did okay in French class. Yeah. I did not have a hot teacher, but I remember that kid's mom, you know, Mrs. Crum, you know, Justin Crum's mom, dude. Everybody oh. knew who she was. Oh, my she God. She came to all the football games, like all done up and stuff, and everybody. Every, sweeping up the crumbs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, every, yeah, yeah. Everybody liked her, dude. That's hilarious. Yeah, I know. So dude. you yeah, you don't like you don't want that mom. You don't want to be that have that mom when you're a young boy. Yeah, dude. I can totally see that. Yeah. <laughs> you don't mind if it's your wife though, huh? Yeah, you no, know, absolutely. Yeah, she's the hot one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the dad huh? is the yeah. dad is proud, you know yeah, you what I'm saying? This? Yeah, hundred percent the dad. Yeah, but. speaking of which, right, dude, yesterday I got a great compliment from uh from Jessica. I was like uh I was changing and she's like, You look thicker. It's like yeah. wow. That's a great compliment <laughs> coming from you. <laughs> yeah. The thickness. I love that. Oh, well, especially when our insecurity is that we've been skinny our whole life. Yeah, so yeah, you get the thick compliments are a great it's compliment. It's like your workout's working. You're looking thick. <laughs> it's like, damn. <laughs> do, you, do you girls ever compliment you like that? Of course. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Or my girl will tell me when I'm not. You know what I'm saying? No, she yeah. doesn't. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Why are you getting all lean right now? Why don't you put on some wet? Re- she'd rather see me. Does she mean lean as in like body fat lean or like Dude, smaller? Yeah. Yeah, well, smaller, right? So I mean, if, oh. I, if, I, if, I, if I stop <laughs> lifting weights, I get skinny fat, right? That's what happens to me for sure. <laughs> right away. I lose the size of my arms and my legs and I get a belly. Like that's yeah. just like my that's my freaking genetics. Thank you. Mom and dad. <laughs> uh so she skinny fat yeah, out. Yeah. She would she would prefer 
she would rather see me, you know, 15 plus percent body fat, but a solid 225, 230 than the, you know, 198 and 5% body fat. Dude, mm. same. This yeah. is why I struggled so much when we were doing that, like, transformation thing and the competition, all that. Like, That's not why you struggle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Good don't, one, dude. yeah, don't lie. <laughs> yeah, 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 he's on yeah. yeah, It was so hard because my wife Courtney like, doesn't like well, it. Well, yeah, she said that. So where's the motivation? You know what I mean? Like, why even bother? Fucking <laughs> I'm yeah, just kidding. Yeah, no, I don't know. that's a good one. Yeah, no, you know um, it's it is funny. Je uh, Jessica does like me better, uh, heavier than than lean too. Even yeah. if I'm shredded, she likes it better. I when think I'm most women do. I actually think it's our own. I think it's guys. Just like how women are probably more bigger critics on uh, with other women, yeah. men are the same way too. Like you, most dudes are in the gym complimenting each other and talking about each other's physiques more than women are talking about it. Yeah. Most dudes think it looks great to be 5% body fat and jacked. There's only a small percentage of girls that are really attracted to that like overly jacked look. Shredded. Yeah, yeah, most girls are not. And there's also the factor if you're in a relationship and you're getting shredded, like they don't like that you're getting attention. Uh, <laughs> they don't want to talk about that, right? Because they look back at the pictures like, oh, my God, I, I didn't even realize. But you realized, you know, you just didn't like the fact that I was getting attention. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think, too, it's also it, sometimes, it, it, for men at least, if you're super shredded, it might be perceived as, like, you care too much. You know what I mean? You spend too much time oh, totally. on how you look. You spend too much time on worrying about. And nobody wants to date that person, unless you're a fanatic, too, and then in which case you could both be dysfunctional together yeah, raging narcissist <laughs> yeah you know what i'm saying yeah but yeah i know yeah she likes it when i'm uh, a little bit heavier but i haven't like she's never i've never i haven't been with her when i've gotten real heavy so we'll see what happens because you know i've done that in the you past really well, press her yeah that. you get a baby yeah. a week a week away so we'll see you know uh, see if you put on that uh, that baby weight any any minute now actually I know, any, I know. She, in so, fact i just got a text from her she came from the midwife appointment and uh, so last week we had a, the midwife appointment and they said that the baby was wasn't in the turned. face the right Hadn't direction. Yet. Yeah, so like the baby's kind of sideways. And what you want is you want the back facing out, right? You want the baby kind of facing your, your spine upside down. That's the best way. <laughs> and so they told Jessica to get on all hands and knees um, for you know two, two times a day, 20 minutes, because I guess the gravity helps the baby turn mm. in the right direction. So she's been doing it and has been a little worried because if you, you, know, you give birth naturally and the baby's back is facing your back, you can have a, it's a longer process. Yeah. So I just got a text and she said that they said, baby's in the right position. Oh, nice. And the baby's dropping. We're good great. to go. And so. Skies are clear. Let's and, go. And oh, she told man. her, she said, tell your husband to blow up the, the tub or whatever, get the tub ready and make sure that's. Oh, working. wow. So you're going to have that all blown up in the house now. So well, that's well, going to be like, that's going to make it feel a lot more real. Right well, now. what I noticed is that uh, with, with midwives, they're a, a big part of what they do is to keep you relaxed. Because natural childbirth, a lot of it is allowing your body to do its job, not freaking out, not being anxious, which is just make it make your body tense up, make it much more difficult. Right. And so they never say things like, "Oh, any day now, it's coming." They're always like, "Well, we don't know." I think they try to they, they keep you from oh, anticipating. Hundred yeah. percent. So she's like, "Fill up the tub," and just goes like, "Why?" <laughs> oh, just you know, just see if it's you know if there's no holes in it. <laughs> Secretly, she's going okay. This this shit could pop in That's the next. I'm 40 thinking, yeah, right now, dude. she's like this could pop in the next forty eight yeah, hours. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a little <laughs> I'm gonna do a little caffeine fast because I'm gonna save that caffeine for when I need it. Yeah. You know what I, mean? <laughs> I want my body to be sensitive to it. <laughs> yeah. um, well, shit, she's pushing for twelve hours. Dude, we weren't ready with caffeine. anything. We didn't have a we, we didn't have can. a bag packed. We didn't have nothing ready, dude. I mean, we were a month early, so it was like you know, oh yeah, totally yeah. didn't happen. I left the Range Rover in the the emergency part parking with the keys in it and running <laughs> we pulled up we pulled up to the uh uh the where the uh, ambulance goes and drops off because mm -hmm. i flew up there she was barefoot she didn't have underwear on she we didn't have yeah. shit <laughs> we roll we roll up and i and i jump out jump out ran in real quick i need a wheelchair i need a wheelchair they come rushing over they get her in the wheelchair and of course I, the natural instinct is not to leave your wife right so like i don't go like oh see you later honey as she's yeah. like right looks like she's about to have the kid right then so I follow them up, and then I, we're up there, and I'm standing there for a second. And they're like, uh, "Sir, are, do you have the white Range Rover that's in the ambulance parking?" I'm like, "Oh shit, yeah, I'm down there." Door, I go down. I left the doors open on it. The keys, it's running, <laughs> it's running. And like, it's, where's the valet? Huh? Yeah, yeah, so we so, take care of this. And now, was she in active labor at that point, or was it early? Like, was she like, "Oh my gosh, this is real"? Intense? No, we had it. We literally had the baby within two hours of getting there, bro. 
Yeah. From, oh, so she basically skipped the early period. Where, well, we had. Oh, remember, we had the two false alarms that made, oh, that they made us yeah. feel like we were amateurs because she went in. She went in t- uh, two days early, right? Remember we at the beach together. We were mm-hmm. all at the beach together. Mm-hmm. She had that whole scenario where she was like, uh, "Hun, I just went to the bathroom and." My panties are soaked, so I don't, I don't know if I pissed myself right now or my water broke. And I'm like, like, well, I got that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can cause that. That thing. happens to me all the time. No, I tell her, I said, call call the midwife, right? So she calls her uh, right away, or the doula, right? She calls her right away, and she's like, um, you should go to the hospital. I know it's a month early, but you should go to the hospital. And we went there. They checked everything. They said, oh, false alarm. It's nothing. You're you just At that point, they are saying that the, the baby is growing so much that – here you can put pressure on the bladder and you can just it's sure. it's very common. You could wet yourself, you probably peed your pants, whatever. So okay, okay. So we go back home. Then uh later on that night, uh contractions start and she thinks that uh you know we're like okay we've already told that it's not coming for like a month like they pretty much and they are like that way like dude until, until it's like an emergency like the hospital sometimes is like lame mm-hmm. you know they're just like oh another here comes a new couple they make yeah. you feel bad for they it. do they make you feel yeah. bad for coming in because it's too early and like you know yeah it's not gonna happen it's the bubble blah, blah, blah so we're like okay so she starts having contractions and you know, we, we're thinking, okay, they told us she's not going to have a baby for four weeks, so they're probably Braxton Hicks, right? So you guys waited. Yeah, so we sat and we uh, we waited, and we, and then they, Katrina looked at me, and she's like, honey, these are so painful. She's like, this is wor- this is way, this can't be Braxton Hicks. She goes, I th- I'm pretty sure I've already had Braxton Hicks. It doesn't feel anything like this. And so I'm like, well, you know, let's just see if it continues. And so then we started timing just to see, and we started timing. And they were like five minutes apart. Then they got down to like four minutes apart. And we're like, um, maybe we should go into the hospital again. So we go down the hospital again. They do the whole scenario with us. They check and they're like, no, it's probably Braxton Hicks. She's, you know, that's all it is. And they're basically telling her like, you know, yeah, it could pretty much be like this for the next three weeks. And so then we go back home again. That's and she's why. looking at me and she's like, honey, I'm going to have to do this for four weeks. She goes, I'm going to need drugs. I don't know if I could do this. And I'm just like, you're okay. You're okay. So we fell asleep that night. Literally like this. So she I was had, in labor the whole time. Yeah. So I we we were laying in bed. This is all night long, and and she uh, I had the phone with the timer with the little app that to, to do the contractions, and I'm she's holding my hand. I'm holding her hand, and we're laying there on the bed. And I would she would squeeze me, and it's what would wake me up. And then I would just automatically hit the button start. You know, so I hit the start button, and then she and then I, I could feel her squeezing my hand and in pain and stuff like that. And she go. Whew, Okay, and then I'd stop it and be like, okay, and we, so we were tracking them all night long, and they were they were starting to accelerate, and I didn't want to go a third time in three days and be told that you know we're a bunch of fucking rookies and don't know what we're doing. I'm like, okay, I know we're okay until because the hospital's not far, so I'm like, we can push this all the way to like two and a half minutes in between or whatever like that. So let's just keep seeing, and they did. And finally, when it hit about the two and a half, we go, okay, let's let's go back to the hospital. This doesn't seem normal. On the way of walking down the stairs to go back to the hospital, water breaks when I'm behind her on the stairs mm. all over the place. I'm like, oh, shit, it is here. Yeah. Yeah. And so we didn't have a bag. We didn't have anything ready because they kept telling us that this ain't happening. Oh, man. Mm. Yeah. I, I am so excited right now. Just yeah. hearing that, too, is getting me excited. You know mm. what I mean? Especially because my kids are older. And now that the you know my daughter's turning eleven soon, and I think back to when they were babies, and I'm like, oh man, I, I you know I wish I could go back in time. I see pictures of, and now I get to do it again. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I'm so pumped. It's got to be a really cool experience for you to to do this, right? Because so such a different. It's 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 less common, right? There's not a lot of parents that have ten year gaps with their kids, right? That's not that often. I don't think so. Right. So it's kind of it's got to be pretty neat. It's such a whirlwind the first time around that now I feel like you know doing it again. I'm a, a total different. I really state hope. Of awareness. I really hope that you have the awareness to share with us as you go through step by step things that you know you've done different. Like I, t- I shared with you guys. I don't know if I did this on air or not, but I talked about like. <clears throat> so I, I had a lot of experience with my my two younger siblings, right? That have ten years plus mm-hmm. on me. So I kind of got to be like a dad, even though I was a teenage boy and obviously don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Uh, but I did. I, I, you know, I d- fed and changed and did all and watched my my baby brother and sister a lot. And I remember, like, you know, when they would cry and they fuss and like trying to put them down sometimes. How frustrating that would get to like, you know, and you get really irritated. And you know, at that time in my in my life, I'm not thinking about my feelings and the energy that he may be picking up from me and like how I'm handling it. I'm not thinking of any of that stuff, right? I'm just like, mom told me. You're I a put- kid. Yeah, I'm a kid, right? And you just you just deal with it. 
where now like I have such a different I I like when he when before he goes to bed like he kind of wrestles around with me and stuff like that. It's just part of his process after bath and then reading. And sometimes when I take him in his room and it's all black and it's time to put him down, he does that where he's like moving around my arms and I don't fight him. I just, I think of like what I've seen. You like, just corral him, right? Yeah, I just corral him. Mm -hmm. I think of it like, like when you've ever seen like, you know, like when chimps are together and they have like a, a baby chimp and the mom just kind of like keeping them in close, you know, letting them play and roll and fight and pull and do all. So like, I don't fight any of it. I just let them do Isn't it. Isn't that weird? They have like, like doing this, a keto with them. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that weird? They have like this little bit of extra energy. They need to like get out. So yeah. Can sleep. And, I, and I feel like when you resist that so much, uh, you only make it worse. It makes them cry. They get irritated. They get frustrated. Then it's this battle. They, and then you get uh, angry about it. Like versus me, like now I have, I have this older version of me that's doing this and I'm just like it's cute to me and it's fun and I like let him do it and then before long and it's weird he'll sometimes he'll fall asleep on his knees with his head between like my armpit because that's just where he <laughs> yeah. ended up when he was tired you know what I'm saying I just let him kind of roll around do his thing and then like next thing I know he's like sleeping there, there was a period of time where for my for my daughter like I don't remember how long this period was, it was a few months or whatever where she just had that she had to have a good cry before she went to bed just the way it was. Like she would get real fussy and then she would cry. And then at some point I'm like, I think she just needs to get this energy out. So I just let her cry and hold her. And then, yeah. you know, after about a minute or so, uh, she'd get tired and fall asleep. Yeah. I want to hear about the moments that with your, your new child that you recognize that you did something different. Like, Oh, I handled this different. I remember now this has brought me back to when I had my two, my two older ones, like with, during this time, and I see how I'm different this time. I think that's it's, interesting to me. I think an old, being an older dad is, I think that's a good thing. I really do. I think you're just wiser. You know what I mean? When you're young, you're just in the tornado mm. and you're like, I got to make money. I got to make sure things okay. And then when you're older, you're like, okay, it's, it's all good. We'll be calm. Well, it's like that. We were just watching the Tom Billy's, uh, the, the Brett Weinstein thing, right? Talking about. Oh, great interview. Right? Yeah, what, great show. Wasn't that good? Him And him talking about. Like, it's on what, his conversations with Tom Billy. On, on YouTube, I believe. I think that's what it's called, right? It's, is that what it's called, Doug? It says Impact yeah. Theory Channel. <clears throat> yeah, it's Impact Theory. But and that it, is called Conversations with Tom. Yeah. That, I didn't know he was doing that, where he was doing the one-on-one -on -one out of a studio, where it's kind of like a pri I like the way they set that up. What did you guys think of that conversation? I, he's really interesting. I didn't know anything about Brett Weinstein. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I've heard Brett Weinstein on, on Joe Rogan. Yeah, it's, it was an interesting conversation. I, I wanted them to get a little bit further into the actual conflict uh, of... You know, both parties, uh, like, I mean, the title of it, wasn't it like something about, civil are we war. going into civil war? You know, it was a very provocative title. And I feel like, um, you know, that, it, like what they were saying in that conversation was really deep and, and it's definitely, you know, thought provoking. Uh, but that, that that title, I'm like, let's get to this. And well, I thought they, they started they, to get to it. They did indirectly. I thought it was really good. Like they're, you know, like I was alluding to right now with the, the whole child throwing a tantrum, how that's like their natural way to try and get of attention. And they kind of tied that, he tied that in to like our culture today and how we're allowing that 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 type of of, of behavior uh, behavior to yep. be rewarded mm -hmm. and I thought that was a really interesting uh take on that and it, and to draw it back to that is our natural instincts as kids to do that to get our way right and we all and, uh, and anyone who's a parent knows that that's not the way to be successful as a, as a kid so and yet, we seem to be rewarding it in adults right yeah. so I thought that was really really fascinating it is it was a great conversation I think the thing that the important thing to understand here that's happened over the last you know, I don't know, 10, uh, maybe 15 years is that it, we stopped thinking that the other side was wrong. And now we think that the other side is evil. Mm. That's very different. Yeah. If you're, if I'm debating, you know, Adam, for example, on a subject, now I know you, right? I know Adam and I know Justin and I know you guys are not evil people, but let's say we're debating uh, a topic and you have a complete, you both have completely different opinions from me. I'm going to debate the idea, but I, but you're not an evil person. I know mm -hmm. that your intentions may be good. Even if I think you're, you're, the idea you have is wrong and it's not going to work, I know your intentions are good, so now we can have a discussion. There's we a level can, of civility there still. There is. Now, if I'm talking to an evil person, right? So if, if, I'm, if, if Hitler all of a sudden comes to life and he's sitting across from me, I'm not going to debate Hitler. I'm going to want to beat him up. Yeah. You're an you're evil berate him. You're an evil person. Yeah. So that's the big problem is that, you know, people on the left think that the people on the right are evil. People on the right think that people on the left are evil, but the reality is And then everybody in the middle, you know, why aren't you picking a side? Yeah. You're evil. Yeah, well, and, and the reality is both uh, the majority of people on both sides want the want the right thing. They want 
people to be better off. They want to help other people. They want to help their families. Some on some subjects, maybe one side is right. On other subjects, maybe the other side is right. But but for the most part, most people are not evil. Like nobody's voting for someone because they are evil and they want bad things. To well, happen. he makes the case in that conversation, right? That it's ne- they're necessary. Yeah. It's a necessary evil to have both opposing sides like that. That's what makes us. That's what makes America so great. Did you guys? So I know you guys didn't watch the full VP debate, but actually that that was the last question from the kid, right? So the kid, an eighth grader, writes in and says that. All I see on TV is this anger and animosity towards you and this division. And I really, I thought Mike Pence did a really good job of responding to that. Like he, I thought he came, like reminded this kid that, oh, don't, you know, don't believe everything that you see on television. And that was where he actually complimented uh, Kamala Harris. And they talked about like, this is what makes our country so great is Mm -hmm. that we do have very opposing sides and we challenge each other hard. And like, so he went into great detail to share that you know don't always don't and that's the problem i think is we live in this uh you know twitter world and 15 second soundbite world and mm-hmm. the, and a bunch of idiots that hear that stuff and they take that and they run with that versus recognizing that they're both necessary evils they both have value and that's what has brought us into this beautiful country that we all live in and it's not something that we need to be like i don't think it's as bad as we make it out to be i think it's the tabloids it's and it's way shit easier to burn everything down than to have hard conversations and to actually work your way together to build something that's different. It's just it's just most people are not evil people. Go find somebody with opposing views from you and talk to them not about their views, but talk to them about their lives. And you'll you'll find you'll a lot, find a lot more in common. You'll find most people they just want what's best for their kids. They care about the well being of other people. They want to do well themselves. Well, that, another thing I really this I really like that interview with Wine Two. I've I never heard anyone explain the left and the right the way the uh, the way the differences in that about how the great value of both of them. The way the left looks more as as the collection of the it was be, compassion collective yeah, compassion yeah collective compassion and moving all of us collectively in a better direction. Which that's the place where most of them come from. If I and I would think most liberals think of themselves that way and then the right is more just they think that the way to get there is through individual uh personal responsibility yeah, personal ros- responsibility so i thought that was really interesting and i thought that was uh, there's i thought that was a great point and i think it's a great point for a lot of people to listen to at this yeah. time well there's a conversation that hasn't been had in a little while which i think is this is that uh that is whatever our if we have, we have this free system where people can kind of do what they want buy what they want so long as they don't hurt other people or steal or that kind of stuff that's great but you also need uh, a society that's uh, otherwise moral and has good ethics for that to also work so that's the weakness in any system um, but you need to have good for example if you look at the fitness space right the fitness space it, it will provide the products and services that people pay for so if all people want are fat burning pills that promise to make you lose 30 pounds in 30 days if all people want are you know uh, aesthetic aesthetic driven programs and insecure you know driven marketing then that's what the fitness space is going to is going to push forward so we we not only want a, you know I don't want the fitness space for example to get regulated but I want it to remain free but I want people to want things that are healthy and good for them because then that's what we'll get kind of produced that's the conversation I think a lot of people um, you know aren't having is that we're not we're, we're kind of missing out on I mean imagine if all the collective you know, uh, desire for, I don't know, distraction, right? You got, so many people want to be distracted. Imagine if everybody, instead of being distracted, wanted to learn and grow. Like how much of that, mm. we, all those resources would get dedicated towards, you know, growth instead. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I think that's a that's a big thing. But it was, it was a good interview. Yeah. Yeah. I really appreciate it. I think uh, um, Billy is doing, the, he's doing a great job on his channel. He's got some really, really good, uh, you know, guests going on. That guy, I, it blows my mind how much he's doing, dude. Ton. Yeah, I can't, I can't keep. I thought that like we drown a lot of people with content. Like no. it's almost impossible. Yeah, to- he's he's a machine. Yeah. Speaking of supplements, uh, I've been experimenting with supplements. It's been around for a little while. No sponsorships with a company that provides us or anything, but just thought I'd bring it up. Have you guys heard of uh, Agmatine? No, before no, not familiar. Very interesting compound. Um, I believe it's, it's, it's related to arginine, um, but it does, when you take it, it lowers your perception of pain. It's got synergistic properties with painkillers, so this is why uh, med- medicine is interested in it. It's actually an effective nitric oxide booster, hmm. um, and you take it with a stimulant, and you get a little bit more of a stimulant kind of effect. So I experimented with this about, I don't know, five years ago, 
bought some more just to see what would happen. Oh, yeah, it's legit, man. You definitely work out and you find yourself pushing a little harder because the perception of pain a little lower. So interesting. A, a very interesting supplement. Yeah, it's hmm. not It's not a classic stimulant. It's I wonder of, what that would be weird. like with paired with something like Kratom that works with that. Like that that's very, Oh, it, it's so it's synergistic with, with things that work with the opiate receptors. That's why I'm wondering how. Now, it, here's the thing, though. Hmm. I, the real quick caution here. Synergistic, sometimes it means it, it amplifies. So right. you might get also negative effects from more negative effects mm. from something like Kratom. So I, I don't want to rec you know, recommend people combine Where did you those. find out about this? Where it's been around for a while, but uh, I, I was at the vitamin shop the other day. It was, you know, like, it's like a GNC, right? Uh -huh. And I still like to walk through there and see you what's going go on. That's <laughs> so funny. We drove by one yesterday and I, yeah. I told Katrina, I'm like, is that always been there? She's like, yeah. I'm like, I can't believe those things are still in business. Bro, it's I, funny. I'll I have a problem. In, I'll go into one of those and like, it's, it's interesting to hear like the their advice in terms of it's all COVID related. You know, they're always like trying to <laughs> pump you up with like vitamin C, vitamin D, you know, this, immunity. that, the other. Immunity. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, wow, so I guess is the direction. I like going. to go through because you guys know I have a bit of a supplement problem. Um, but I also like to look at the backs of the bottles to see, okay, what are they putting in? What are they trying to promote? And I kept seeing this pop up in, in uh, some supplements. Oh, so interesting. I remembered reading about it a long time ago, did, did yeah. a little bit more research. Like, Let me try this out and see what happens. Dude, how's, um, how's the distance learning going with your kids? I have a bit of a story with this so far. It's been really rough. <laughs> Dude. Uh, and, and, and I kind of have come to conclude that the way this is set up is just not in parents' favor at all. And really, it's a power structure. Because if you think about it, you're implementing this this curriculum from a teacher who's the authority, but you're just basically the manager in this situation that's trying to make sure that everybody's you're like the taskmaster, you mm -hmm. know. And so this is where you know I know Courtney's struggling with this quite a bit in terms of them, you know, like having having uh, outbursts, you know, and frustration all directed at her. But then, you know, trying to to do all this stuff, uh, you know, virtually uh, to to appease the teacher. So anyway, so my my solution to this, which uh, I've, I was really trying to think about this because it's it's like it's frustrating for everybody involved, uh, was to kind of bring in another element of of the power dynamic, right? So you know, bringing myself into this is like an evaluation process. So uh, daily, weekly, the total, like like how basically they were behaving, like uh, in terms of they got up on time, if they're dressed, if their attitude is good, uh, you know, if they're listening well, if they completed their homework, how good the homework was. I had to have all these qualifications uh, to then evaluate. So that way, now it's like, oh, okay, like you know, we, we actually have to take this seriously because that's the biggest problem is like they just haven't like they're not taking it seriously that's a really home. that's a really smart actually recommendation are you doing like some sort of like a chart with like stars on it or yes. doing some sort of a reward you having system? production meetings with your kids yeah it feels like that <laughs> hey, it really no, that's does a, that's actually really fucking smart now what happens, i know that's a big challenge right now for a lot of a lot of parents bro it's huge you have no idea i've talked to so many parents are you now what do you do if they don't like let's say they don't do something do they get yeah, so they get negative. Uh, so here's the thing: um, they get a score from one to six uh, based off of these qualifiers, like of what I'm evaluating. And so then, Court, I leave it to Courtney to, you know, give them sort of a score on that, and then I review it with them when I get home. And, you know, I haven't actually got to a point where I did a full week yet. So what basically is, is like, uh, take something away. Yes. Gift. Screen, screen time. Or, gift or take away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so then, you know, and, and of course the gifts are going to be real small things or whatever, like little wins, like, yeah, whether it's electronics, whether it's, you know, a little Lego toy or whatever it is, you know, like having a friend over to stay over. That's a brilliant idea, dude. Dude, it's yeah. so challenging. I talked to parents. So, you know, there's a, there's a huge like ADD problem, right? Right? Like uh, children have been medicated more and more because they can't sit still. And my personal belief is I don't, I, I definitely think that there are, that ADD exists, but I do also think that the way the system is designed is some people are just, they do better when they move around. They don't do so well sitting still. I'm one of those people. Mm -hmm. And so I don't necessarily think, and also I think there are factors that can contribute to that poor diet, unstable home is how we're teaching, maybe influencing that. So I have parent. I know parents who have kids who were borderline rambunctious or whatever. Not necessarily ADD. Never been diagnosed, but now they're they're they're, they're thinking their kids have ADD. And I'm like, well, it's because your kid now is sitting in a chair looking at a 2D image all day. Mm -hmm. Now they're sitting in a, not only before they were in a classroom, which was challenging for them. Right. Now they're in front of a computer. They're in fourth grade. 
What do you think? You know, so I, I imagine that this is probably, you know, going up. I'm wondering if more kids are putting on meds because of yeah, this and distance it, learning. And, and really, like, if it was just about homeschooling, at least then you can determine your, oh. your own hours, totally. your own environment. Like, like them having to log in at that, you know, early morning time, like, and and be on there and check in and, like, be forced to, to, to subscribe to this, you know, regimen is, is way less it, empowering. To the, to the parents. Here's my personal. So with so I'm blessed in this regard. My both of my kids have always done really well in school. My daughter has always loved school. Like looks forward to waking up for school. Looks forward to going to school the next day. She's very on. Like if she gets a project and it's due Friday, she's doing it Monday. She does it way in advance. Like never had to worry. First time ever in my daughter's life is she not like school ever. Mm. This it never comes out of her mouth. Mm. She still does well. She's very responsible. I still don't, I don't have to like be on top of her, but I've never heard my daughter ever say, oh, I got to go to school tomorrow. Oh, I got to, she hates it because of the, the way, and she's in a pod. She's not even by herself. She's with three other girls. She doesn't Mm -hmm. like it. My son, he does well. I never have to be on top of him, but I tell you, dude, the kid from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., he's in front of his computer, not moving. When I come home from work, I pull him out of his room. I have to drag him outside, and he literally look, he looks like someone that's been chained in their basement for yeah. years. Yeah, he's, zombie. They're just oh, not motivated to go outside he's anymore. Pa- he's pale. Yeah. He's just uh, hey, what's up? like? Listen, yeah, we're gonna the, go for a walk. And dude. the pod thing is difficult too, man, because you get all these crazy parents that are like they want to keep their kid in a bubble uh, because they're they're afraid of everything. Oh, dude, I, I, I just, I can't deal with it. I yeah, can't deal with people. Like I that. know. So I, I don't know, man. It's been, it's a very cha- challenging time. I think for a lot of parents. Uh, and yeah, it's been a challenge. I took Max to swim lessons, and I kind of had a feeling like it wasn't going to go very well. And Wait, how old is he? He's one, right? One yeah, and a half. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's young. Yeah, it's young for sure. Um, and and really, it was like so. I it, really, this has a lot to do with like getting Katrina comfortable. So one of the other things that like you know we're we're not probably see eye to eye is. I'm like, I was already dunking him in the, in the bath, like, like way long ago, you know? And I had to do it when she like leaves the room. Cause she would freak the fuck out. Like she just, he's a baby. What are you doing? He's going to think he's going to be traumatized. Like I'm trying to drown him or something. I'm like, no, it's not. Let's do the thing where you blow in his face yeah, and put him blow under? in his face. Yeah. They naturally close their mouth and they get in there. And I, and, and I let, I used to let him really early on when he could barely even crawl, like kind of move around the bathtub, let him go fall and slip and go under a little bit. And then I'd pick him back up and then make sure it's not a big deal. Yeah, and, yeah. Right, you know, the kid's not gonna fucking drown when I'm in the bathtub with him, right? Yeah. So I'm not worried about that. And so now we're moving into the pool and like we're doing pool time and like I I want to be a little more aggressive with him and allow him to kind of like let him go, let him try to kick. Because naturally kids will do that. Like you've yeah. seen, I don't know if you've ever seen like videos. I've seen of, those videos of infants where yeah, they just like, let them like go in three, the water like they, before they can they turn up before yeah. they can crawl. A lot of times can learn to swim and swim to get to their head to top. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I know this and I've had younger siblings and I've been in pools my whole life and so. You know, I'm trying to get Katrina to be more comfortable with kind of stretching him a little bit and let so he because I want him to learn how to swim really early so we don't have to worry about when we're around pools and shit like that, him falling in. So a lot of this, truthfully, is to get her comfortable so she can hear a fucking person that is a teacher for this say all the same goddamn things I've been saying, right? So this is a Katrina pool lesson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Secretly, I'm giving it up now too, because I'm sure she'll listen, right? Uh-huh. So yeah. So, okay. Anyway, so I'm, cause I'm like, I already know he's, he's at a place where he won't let go of me. Right. And then on top of that, like, okay, this is a totally new place and there's lots of stuff going on and it's loud and all kinds of people and kids jumping in pools, splashing. And here comes me with my son. I got to wear a mask, which I don't wear a mask around him at, hardly at all. So he doesn't really see that on my face. I'm, I'm wearing a mask around. The instructor's got a big fucking face shield on old ladies never seen before. It's kind of a scary environment. Yeah, no shit, dude. <laughs> and it, we wonder why he won't fucking let go of me you know what i'm saying like, like, what's going on? yeah <laughs> like just, like oh, i already look weird. like when, I put, me to the alien. when i put the mask on before we went in and i'm carrying him he kind of gave me like this like sideways look like what the fuck is dad doing you know right so <laughs> right so i already and then i'm in a pool with it and then uh so it was a disaster as far as like it, any sort of success with it i mean it was good because the pool they keep it at 91 and so every time i've taken him in a pool before it's been really cold and that seems to be bothering him more than anything else, than more than fear. So, 
yeah, we'll see how how it what we do to progress this. But I, I I told Katrina already, I'll do it again for you, and we'll do a group one. Try that, but it's important. Swimming lessons are super important, especially if you if you live near a pool. I mean, we did that with uh, with my kids when they were really young because we had a pool. And, um, you know, that's the safest thing you could do is have your kids learn how to swim. Yeah. You, know, you put up a gate, you can do all that stuff. Safe. I do the same thing with, uh, with gun safety. So like yesterday, I took my son for the first time, by the way, he, uh, you know, fired a, a handgun. So he's 15. So I took him to the range and he was able, I, I brought my revolver oh. and he was able to do it. But before that, I go through all the gun safety, like, you know, treat yeah. every gun Massively like it's important. loaded. Here's how you open it. This is how you hold it. Never put your hand here. Um, and because if you have the responsibility, if you have a gun, um, you, your people in the house should know uh, gun safety and know how to handle it. Because most yeah. of the accidents that happen are accidents, right. not someone doing it uh, on purpose. You well, know, not so. to mention, yeah. if, if there was an intruder when you weren't home and your 15-year-old son is the only one there, you want him to be able to protect himself too if he absolutely had yeah, to. Not yet. Yeah. Not, not yet. Until when he's really proficient, yes. Because otherwise, you'll... <laughs> He well, just, that's how he'll pull it out, and the burglar just grab it from him. You no, know, that's how. Well, I mean, that's <laughs> how it starts. So you have to teach him at one yeah. point. You know what I'm saying? Or if you wait till he's 20 something before no, he learns that. I just started. I've seen so. those statistics though. Yeah, it all, it's always better to educate uh, and have them like handle the gun versus like them just you know sort of be afraid of it. Totally, totally. Hey, dude, I was uh, speaking to my son. So we sometimes him and I go on YouTube and we'll show each other funny things. And I was looking up like uh, nostalgic 90s commercials. Oh, Do yeah, you guys yeah, yeah. remember Herbal Essence shampoo commercials? <laughs> I love Do we? Do you, oh, yeah, it was like oh, the most like orgasmic moans, dude, you know. I, My, my son's like, what the fuck? Oh, he had never <laughs> seen them before. No, I mean, they, don't, they don't do those anymore, do they? No. So it's basically, so for people who don't know, it was a shampoo commercial. How do you not know And those? the those woman super wa famous. washing her hair is moaning like she's orgasming. Yeah. And so my kid's like, this was a commercial? Well, like, the, it was effective. They sold the shit. Actually, the that was, I mean, Herbal Essence may be, we may be able to credit them for doing the first bit of like really edgy type of advertising like that. Mm. They were one of the first companies to kind of push those limits, at least that I remember. Every girl I I know, like you could smell it in their hair because it was like a very floral kind of a smell. It's just like, it, it, but anyways, that was that was one of those things too. Like I, I I wasn't talking to him about that, but what what brings to mind, you know, that kind of kind of a thing was that like Courtney has like certain shampoos that we have. We all kind of use her shampoos, and she's just like sick of it, whatever. <laughs> So I, I finally got like uh, my hands on some of the Dr. Squatch version because I've had the soap, but I didn't. They actually have the shampoos too and oh, conditioner, I, and so I brought those home and I'm using them like oh good and I'm like kind of joking like oh, finally I can smell like a man you know and like and the kids like heard me like talking about that oh no and so they like stole it from me. And, and I'm like, where would it go? And they're like downstairs, like putting, they're all like, you know, super proud that they smell like a man now. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if they think it's gonna make them stronger or something like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Like I, I know I have no hair, but I use it on top of my head all the time because of the tea tree oil. It's you got hair for, on the side. Yeah, it's for the dry skin. <laughs> fuck off, guys. <laughs> for the I, I mean, I have my psoriasis spots that I have on my head, and it's how it's half of what keeps tea tree it. oil is good for uh, yeah. dandruff too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good. I, did you do? Did you guys use their their uh, toothpaste yet? I haven't used it. I just oh, literally put haven't it, yet. I literally. Put so it in yeah. my bathroom last Love it. night. Love oh, you use it. They, they have, have a night. Day, they have a daytime and a nighttime. Yeah. So the daytime one has got ginseng, uh, vitamin B12, and I can't remember. There's a there's a mineral in there that's very similar to tooth and enamel. Mm. Apparently, if you brush your teeth with it, it can help strengthen teeth and even heal uh, cavities. By the way, what smart thing. marketing? Yeah, and then uh, you know, morning and then the night one. Well, the ingredients too? are legit. The yeah. evening one's got valerian, chamomile, and saw palmetto. Which for a man, saw palmetto is a natural. DHT receptor blocker, which is good for uh, hair loss, actually. In fact, that's why I use the yeah, salt palmetto shampoo. Thanks for pointing out. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> I point right late at to the game, but I hey. point right <laughs> at <laughs> in case I'm unaware. Yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> totally. Hey, hey, I started doing. Do you guys remember when I used to do my egg yolk shakes in the morning? Yeah. Oh yeah. I started. How doing many did you put in there? Like six or eight? Or uh, what? between six to ten. Yeah. So, and this may, this ten. this may be why uh, Jessica that's said why I was looking thick. That's yeah. why you a thick boy with a bunch of C's. Yeah. Yeah, dude. So, uh, you know, oh, here's a disclaimer. Yes, if you put raw eggs in your shake. Shake, you could run the risk of salmonella. Yes, low, it's a tiny risk, okay, but uh, it's your own. Take your own, risk, you know, risk, and it, it's up to you. But I, when I do this, more importantly, you'll feel like Rocky. Yeah, when I, yes. hey, listen, <laughs> you can cook your eggs too if you want. When I do this, when I have my you know, six wimps. to ten egg yolks in the morning 
legit. If, if I do this for like a two week period, I will get stronger every time. It is the most effective supplement ever is bumping your cholesterol, having the egg yolks, yeah. and then watch what happens. I know you Completely swear. Completely contrary to, uh, yeah. People, people, people being be afraid, told, yeah, of cholesterol. Too much fat and cholesterol. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, don't eat it. Anyway. Don't I, do it. I was having a, a conversation with my aunt uh, the other day. So I have a, I have an aunt that is, I love her because her and I will, we've always been, we've always debated each other. When I was younger, uh, you know, it was more like arguments because she was, she's closer to my age. But now that I'm older, we have these wonderful discussions about anything, any topic, and I love her because even if we uh, do, you have many different perspectives or views on things. Sometimes, although although most of them now are very similar, yeah. Sometimes we have differing uh, opinions, and so we were having a conversation about the impact of the internet. And I'll, I remember a long time ago, I had this huge debate with her of the internet, and I said, "This is wonderful." You know, it's going to give ac humans access to like all the information in the world, and this is going to be so many things. And I remember she's like, "That's not necessarily a good thing." We got this big debate. Well, anyway, uh, I had a conversation about it uh, with her again, and I said, "You know, you were right. I just didn't understand it because I was younger back then." And she said, "What do you mean?" I said, "You know, we do have access to all this information, and I can safely say people now yeah. have more knowledge." than they've ever had, especially younger people. They know way more facts and knowledge than ever because it's just there whenever they want to look it up. But we lack wisdom. Yeah. That doesn't give you wisdom, right? We're not listening to the right people. No, and so then he was, check this out, right? So we're talking about this and it dawned on me. If you think of like a like as you grow up as a human, right? You're a, you're a baby, then you're a ch you know toddler, then you're you know adolescence, teenager, 20s, 30s, 40s, and, and beyond. When you're a teenager, and I'm seeing this with my son, when you're a teenager, that's the first time where you actually know stuff. Like, yeah. you really know stuff. Like, my son's 15. He's a smart kid. He'll sit there, and he'll debate things with me, and he's got facts and knowledge. But he comes to stupid conclusions because he lacks wisdom. <laughs> I told him this the other day. I said, you know things. It's true, but you lack experience, so all you have is knowledge, and you have uh, no wisdom. Yeah. Um, so it was a great discussion that I had, you know, with my aunt. Does uh, that like resonate with him yet, or it's like one of just those just piss things him off? Just kind of yeah, it, just it, angry. It pisses him off, but luckily he's a, he tries to be objective. And what's funny is that he was telling me how. Logic is so much better than emotion. This was great, great conversation. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, go full Spock. Oh, dude, yeah. he's so he's so my son. It's so ridiculous. Yeah. It's annoying too. He's like, oh, logic is better than emotion. Emotion is not good, and he is. He's that's exactly how he is. He, Jessica says his emotional range is between a, a two and a four. Like doesn't go any, <coughs> any yeah. you know below or above that or whatever. And I said, well, emotions part of what makes us human. And so then, as we're going, he starts to get angry and he starts to be logical about his anger. And I'm like, mm. you're just being emotional, buddy. I said, <laughs> <laughs> it was really good. Speaking of expressing your feminine side, yeah, uh, yeah I. Uh, it's funny uh, when I got to, uh, our little wiener dog. You know, like I knew, like right, because I have you know this crazy beast of, of another dog that's like I. You know, my whole my whole plan with him was to get good training and everything was, you know, chaotic and then, you know, sort of harnessing that in and like maintaining control. Like like my little dog's been really easy, but uh, at the same time, it's been difficult for me because there's certain things that I have to do differently with this little dog than I did training the big dog. So the little dog, I have to be like extremely like happy and like, ooh. Come here. What? Like I have to like uh, he will not come to to me. Like he won't recall to me unless I have like this really high feminine voice. <laughs> and it's really emasculating. So that's when you get a chick dog, bro. <laughs> I know exactly. <laughs> that's where they come from. I right. seriously didn't yeah. even like consider that, but I was like it's, out at the dog park bro. with my friend and like he was he was running off and I'm like Finn, get over Finn, calm and it's, in the course he like looks back and just does and then I'm like Finn. He's like, oh, what? And then just starts running right to me. I'm like, no. He's so cute, dude. He's yeah. the cutest. Dog. Hey, speak, I can't handle it. Speaking of training, still getting great messages from people going through the NCI certificate. You know, I just, I just spoke about wisdom and knowledge. Yeah. That's that's what they do well. That's It just uh, hit me right now. They try to take the knowledge of coaching online, but apply it through wisdom, which means, uh, okay, it's great. You know all this stuff. How do you coach people? Like, how do you communicate it? To clients, that's a big part of their uh, of their process, and so I'm getting good messages. From I actually had a really good call with Jason yesterday, and just talking about the uh, the future of our partnership. And he was just kind of asking my feedback because we're coming up on a year that we've been working together, and uh, he's asking some of the things that I thought uh, that they could do to help support our our audience. And I said, moving in a direction where 
I said, I, I think obviously with this pandemic, I said, it's, it's accelerated this. I thought we were moving this direction anyways, but many trainers are, you know, moving away from training a lot uh, in person and more virtual and trying to figure out how to totally. do, how to make that transition, how to scale that business. I said, I think you have a lot of wisdom around that. You've coached a lot of other coaches. And I said, and you guys offer a platform that is great for educating many of these trainers. So I think more things, more either free content that's around it or even paid content that you guys create around that, I think would probably want be one of the best things that we do in 2021. And he was pretty pumped about it. We got a call again today to kind of follow up and probably start putting some of that stuff in motion. Yeah, one of the biggest uh, mm. questions I get it from trainers, because one thing I love about trainers is that what makes them trainers is that they really want to help people. It's like yeah, their number they, one driver. Yeah, they care about people. Yeah, and uh, one of the big questions I get is, how do I provide as much value uh, virtually as I can in person. And that is a big challenge. That's a yeah. big challenge to be met. But I think there are you, you just have to change the way you approach things. It's a completely different uh, – there are different obstacles, but I think it's possible. First question is from ZT Roan 32 What can you do to get better at the overhead press? The Z press. Uh, Z press is great. Z press. Great great advice. Add a Z press and just start with light weight if you have to, like, uh, you know, real, real, just the bar, you know? Dude, I got one for you because, okay, so aside from pressing more often and practicing different rep ranges and doing different versions of presses, kettlebells, dumbbells, barbells, the one thing that I ever did that gave me the biggest, like, immediate impact were overhead carries. They, it gave me it, it, right away. I saw an improvement in my overhead presses from doing different versions of carries. Either either the ones where I have like a, a really heavy kettlebell racked on one side or both arms and maintaining tension and carrying, or especially pressing kettlebells, dumbbells, or something up above my head and then walking, just holding that top position, that tension. Mm -hmm. I saw like a ten pound increase in my. And I'm talking about this is way later in my lifting career when adding five pounds is a big deal. I saw my, my lift go up 10 pounds. Like the first thing was like two weeks after I started doing yeah. overhead carries. Yeah. I had this uh, some very similar experience with that. And, and really it was about being able to stabilize in that top position, I think is so crucial. And again, that is, that's addressed with the Z press. Like you really have to put the work in, in terms of how you're, you're bracing and how everything is, is holding in things in place for that to, to occur. And so, you know, to hold something overhead and really train yourself to hold that for a period of time helps tremendously with that. But you got to think of the overall joint of, of the shoulder. And so this is why, again, here's my button that I'm always hammering is, is rotation. And so for me, the, the biggest unlocking factor to success with overhead press for me was really starting to work more into that natural rotation that my shoulder wants mm. to get through and then add little bits of resistance to that, which people don't understand that you can add little bits of resistance and strengthen the rotators and, and do it in a safe and effective manner where all of that pours right back into the overall strength and stability and support. Totally. A, a huge limiting factor for a lot of people with an overhead press is, uh, or mobility issues. So, you know, and I've seen this with clients and I've seen this even with myself um, because when I first started working out, I did a lot of bodybuilding type movements and I wasn't focusing a lot on full range of motion. And here's how you know, right? So you could do something like a wall test. Um, and I know we did uh, a wall test in our mapsprimewebinar.com. And if you do a wall test and you find that difficult, what you run into when you do an overhead press with a barbell or dumbbells is you have resistance from your own body. So you actually see this sometimes. You could take someone, even with a lot of muscle, have them straighten their arm up above their head, but also have them straighten out their spine, maintain good posture. And without any weight, they find difficulty keeping their arm in that position. That's resistance that is happening to your arm uh, and your shoulder without you actually holding weight. So you are lifting, let's say, 10 pounds less than you can because of this internal lack of, uh, of stability uh, and mobility. So stability and mobility make a, a, a huge difference for a lot of people. In fact, even simple like external rotation exercises like rotator cuff exercises. They know the ones that the physical therapist will give you where you grab the bands and you externally rotate, that, that type of stuff. Even something like that, sometimes you'll see someone practice that and their overhead press will go up five or 10 pounds because the limiting factor was that their stability wasn't good, that they mm -hmm. had poor 
mobility. And that's more, some exercises, it's more common than Stability others. Mobility provides more force production. Totally. And totally. I think that it was shoulders, that's it's 99% of the time. Oh, yeah. It's, it's very it's so rare common. that when someone asks a question like this that it has anything else to do with any, it's not the lack of certain exercise you're doing. It's, it's not anything more than that most people are very uncomfortable with a full extension above their head with their shoulder in the right position. Exercises like Z press, I think, are incredible. That a good movement to start before you go into that, a uh, reach roll lift. Mm. Like so, oh, yeah. I I love reach roll lift to kind of prime uh, before it's you go exercise. go into the, one of these movements that we're. All, and then if you do reach roll lift, the overhead carries, the Z press, and then like Justin's, uh, you know, uh, Arnold Arnold press with kettlebells sure. or whatever. Yeah, those movements phenomenal. For Absolutely. That. Next question is from Cat Ill Est. How do I fix an imbalance between my left and right lats? Uh, same way you would work on an imbalance with any right to left uh, muscle, which is to place more emphasis on the weaker, smaller side. Now, here's the challenge with this. The challenge is, and I know because I ran into this too as a, as a younger lifter, you're afraid you're going to slow down your gains because you're focusing on the weaker side. Mm. You're not. The bigger side isn't going to shrink to match the smaller side. It's just that you're going to get the smaller side to to speed up a little bit. One way you can do this, and I remember Adam bringing this up on the podcast a long time ago as a, as a physique competitor. This is something he had to focus heavily on because he was getting judged uh, by his physique on stage, was to do unilateral exercises, so one arm or one-legged exercises, right? So in this case, it'd be one arm. And then allow the weaker side to dictate the weight and the reps. Yeah. So if I'm doing like a one-arm row or one arm pull down with perfect form, and the most I can do is 100 pounds for you know 12 reps with my weaker side, that's what I'm going to do with my stronger side. Even if I could do more th than that with the stronger side, I'm going to stop there. So it's the weaker side that's dictating the sets and the reps. And then what will happen, and you'll find by doing it this way, is it actually catches up. It actually does catch up uh, pretty quickly you know, to, to do it this way. So um, exercises. Uh, rows, uh, you said lab. I mean, literally almost everything that you would do with both your hands, yeah. you could do by yourself. So a seated single arm row, mm. a lap pull down single arm row, a right. dumbbell row, a hammer strength. Row. I mean, all those, there's tons of exercises that you can do. Almost anything that you could do with a barbell that you would do for your back, you could do with single arm with a dumbbell. And so this is a perfect time to make your routine be all unilateral for a while. And I, I had to do this for my shoulders. I had to do this for my chest. I had to do this for my biceps, all at p different periods of my training career. You just get, um, you just get avoided barbells. Yeah, uh, I just avoid it, avoid it for a while, and it only, it, honestly, it only took. I, I want to say three to six months. I can't remember. Each one was probably a little bit different, but just simply focusing all, all on unilateral. So one arm, one leg, like you said, uh, at a time in your routine, getting rid of the barbell stuff for a while. Uh, because this is a priority, right? I know you hear us talk on the show all the time about barbell exercise, barbell, 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 but that's why there's always exceptions to the rule. Mm -hmm. Like if someone's asking me, oh, I, you say you need to do barbell exercises all the time, but then you guys say to do dumbbell exercises and get rid of barbell exercises, well, that's because this person right here, this is an example of this now takes over a priority of mm. you know what exercise technically would build the most muscle on their body, and it's more let's get it balanced out. Then we can go back to those barbell movements, right? And also to I, I guess I just think I think also about posture and what maybe maybe a, a block in that process in terms of unlocking uh, more potential for you to gain access to your lat. So what if like your 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 your, your chest, for instance, and your pecs are, you know, a bit tighter on, uh, you know, on your other side. And, and you really need to do the work of, of mobility uh, and, and assessing where those deficiencies may lie. If there's any asymmetry or anything within, uh, you know, your posture that you can realign uh, in order for you now to then, um, you know, really be able to focus on gaining more connectivity towards uh, the lat. Next question is from Beck Pastor. What value does a cool down provide after a workout? What is the best way to cool down? Okay, so cooling down, um, if you had to compare it to priming, uh, I don't think it's uh, as important, but it does have uh, some value. From a muscle building perspective, static stretching, first off, this is when you do it. You would do the static stretching at the end of the workout. Um, so if you just worked out your back or your chest, now you're going to slow down and you're going to focus on these long stretches of this muscle, especially if it's pumped. 
Studies show that this does contribute to more muscle growth um, and better recovery. So that's part of it. Um, the other part of it is it gets you into that state of recovery a little bit faster and better and in, in a more organized way rather than stopping your workout all of a sudden cold and then moving mm. to the next thing. You, you, you have a process of allowing your body to come down to a more uh, a, a better mm. state. Now for endurance athletes, a little bit more valuable. Um, you, you, you tend to get this blood pulling effect in your extremities when you're uh, running or cycling a lot. And so cool downs can prevent some of the dizziness that some of them would experience after cycling. So rather than like doing a hard cycle and then just stopping, they would do a hard cycle and then kind of slow down. But in my experience, cool downs are excellent for doing uh, correctional static stretching, improving range of motion, um, and then uh, accelerating muscle growth through that that static stretching uh, period. I think there's a lot of opportunity here. I think that this is definitely an overlooked uh, aspect of working out and training in general uh, to where, yeah, you can bring yourself down into that more parasympathetic state. And for athletes, how beneficial is that when you can, you can control your body and be able to get yourself into that state a little bit more effectively, a little more efficiently and train your way there. And, and I think a good way to do that that would be to really implement these uh, cool downs in your workout and start training your body how to respond like that. So if you're in a really rigorous activity and event, uh, it, it, to be able to then calm the system down and 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 regenerate some energy, uh, I think that would be massively beneficial. Well, I think I, I think it all depends on you know what who you are. You weekend warrior person who kind of just is approaching, you know, f working out and just trying to stay healthy and fit and you know, balanced lifestyle and you know, that person to me if you're if you're getting the main lifts in, you're eating well, sleeping well, you're doing like you're taking care of the big rocks, um I don't think this is a, that big of a deal. If you are a competitor, if you're somebody who's competing and you're and you're looking for the competitive edge, whether that be sport or building a physique and looking to you know, maximize optimal hands. This does matter. Um, and it matters a lot, actually. I mean, you, to your, you guys, both your point about the parasymp parasympathetic system, getting into that state allows your body to start to recover. Until you're in that state, you haven't started the recovery process. So let's just use hypothetical numbers and just pretend that, you know, you go and you don't do a cool down and say it takes a half hour to an hour before your body actually switches over into that system and says, oh, okay, we've calmed down now. He's no longer hammering me with weights or running on the treadmill or beating me up. It's no longer stress time. Now it's time to start recovering and rebuilding. And let's say that's a, it takes your body naturally, you know, a half hour, hour to do that. And let's say when you do cool downs, it only takes it 15 minutes to do that because you did a cool down process. Now that 15 minutes of recovery times five to seven days a week, times 30 days a month, times 300, you know, in a year, mm -hmm. that shit really starts to add yeah, up. So if, if you are a competitive athlete or looking for the next edge, this, this stuff does make a huge difference. And this is where things like, you know, cryotherapy and ice baths and infrared, all these, these tools really start to come into play where, man, these can be difference makers for somebody who is trying to take their recovery and take their training to a whole nother level. Well, you saw that with LeBron James's all his yeah. money he poured into that direction. And it right. did make a massive difference. Yeah, you know what's funny is that bodybuilders instinctively have done this for a long time. But there's like a ritual, especially in, in the older days of bodybuilding. After a workout, they would go out and uh, they'd, they'd eat a big meal and go lay out in the sun. Mm -hmm. now, this is what they did, right? Or after a, a hard workout, I have... A, by the way, eating is parasympathetic, right? When you eat food, it kicks in this this digest. Rest and digest is what parasympathetic stands for uh, or kind of does. And bodybuilders, again, they've done this instinctively. I, every time I... When I work out, one of my favorite things to do, and this is even after I understood that eating after I work out isn't as important, doesn't really make a huge difference. I still like the process of... I just had a hard workout. Now let me relax and eat. It's really part of the cool down process from an instinctual perspective. Next question is from Neal Robert Curran. Can you recommend a good shoe for squatting and deadlifting? Does it make a difference or would you bother? Different shoes for, for these here. Yeah, it really depends on the person too. Mm -hmm. So ideally, okay, let's say you have great mobility, great stability, good foot strength, everything looks good. 
uh, barefoot or as barefoot, as close to barefoot as possible would be best for all lifts. Yeah. Because Flexible, flat uh, soles. Yeah, because you're working with your feet are strong, your ankle mobility is good, hip mobility is good, everything looks good. Now, what you don't want is you don't want something under your foot that's going to be a crutch or prevent you from strengthening all your stability, right? But that's not typically the case, right? With most people, they have issues. And so let's say you have bad ankle and foot mobility and strength, and you go and try and do barefoot deadlifting or barefoot, squat, uh, barefoot squatting especially. Mm. You're, you might hurt yourself. So in that case, you might want to transition and start with something that has a strong, stable sole, especially for squatting, mm -hmm. something that maybe has a little bit of a heel rise in it. So squat shoes, very stable, a little bit of a heel rise. I don't think you should stay there. I think you should slowly and gradually work on your ankle mobility and your foot mobility in order to do that. Deadlifts, uh, you, you probably do want um, a, you know, a nice, strong sole, but flat because you want to be lower to the ground. Mm. If you have a little bit of a rise in your ankle, and, you and deadlifts don't require nearly as much ankle mobility as squats do. Um, and so you, and also if you have a rise in your heel, it just throws your weight forward anyway, which makes it the deadlift yeah, no, I, less I, effective. I'm, yeah. You have to address this because it's, it's a popular thing I see. I don't know why this is common. Um, and maybe just because I think the people that buy the shoes don't understand. Like using uh, squat shoes with heel raises in a deadlift is silly. It's, yeah. You're making it more challenging for yourself. Yeah, no. You're not, you're not helping yourself whatsoever. You want to be lower. Yeah, you want to be as close to the ground as your heels as flat <laughs> as possible. Heels, yeah, yeah you're, you're adding an extra Glued. inch uh, of pull that you have to do now. So uh, squat shoes while – and that's why they're called squat shoes and not deadlift shoes – you know, wearing those shoes while you're also deadlifting is not ideal. You know, it's interesting though. Like, so um, when Sal was actually the first person to introduce uh, squat shoes to me, again, I was never into powerlifting, even lifting very heavy. And this was back when we were really picking apart my squat and trying to improve it. And Sal was like, you should really try these squat shoes, see if it really helps you out. And boy, it was, it was a game changer for me because I lacked the ankle mobility. And so there, I went on a kick for a while where I was wearing squat shoes a lot when I was squatting because I did feel a lot better. Because uh, it did it, it, it was crutching my my uh, my lack of mobility in my ankles. Then I went on that whole hardcore kick of working on mobility. Got rid of the shoes, didn't do it at all. Trained a lot of barefoot training. Now what I love to do because I train mostly in chucks or barefoot most of the time, but every once in a while I'll go to do like some heavy squats and I'll throw those squat shoes on and it's like, it's a, like turbo. Yeah. It's like a tur it's like cuz now I'm getting an extra inch that I don't have to squat in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. When you think about that, that's I have less range of motion that my knee has to travel and so it's easier. So mm -hmm. if I have if I've done a good job of working on my ankle and hip mobility for a long time consistently, which I have, and most of the time squatting in flat shoes or barefoot, every once in a while when I throw them squat shoes on, it's like it reminds me of the feeling of having the belt and not having the belt. It's like yep. when you train mostly without a belt, then you go throw that sucker on there once in a while. It's like, oh, you get a little extra gear out of it. So yeah, it's interesting because um, I mean, I, I I probably wore running shoes and like cross trainers a lot in my career, just because the athletic background and whatnot. Like it was a lot more movement based and running and you know athleticism and all that kind of stuff. And when I actually was in this gym, I saw a lot of my uh, coworkers wearing chucks and like they were doing everything in chucks or these like those five finger shoes. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I was the guy making fun of them and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but start to realize, I mean, the having running shoes, running shoes are literally engineered to get you to uh, be able to move forward. Like everything is moving forward. Nothing is considered and side cushion. to side and cushion. And, impact. cushion. <laughs> and so it's like, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I almost rolled my ankle just tr going side to side or twisting and rotating or doing anything like that. That's the worst shoe that you could train in. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that out there. That's a great point. Oh, dude, you ever see someone heavy squat and they've got like Nike Max Air running shoes? It's like they're standing on Dyna discs. They've yeah. got these. You, yeah. You don't want to use running shoes for heavy lifting because there's so much cushion that they're unstable, unless that's that's what you're trying to do. And great. to Justin's point, left to right, which is where you see those injuries happen. Lots oh, of injuries terrible. in that direction. And you, have you guys seen the deadlift shoes that powerlifters use? Just back to what you were saying about not wearing squat shoes. Deadlift shoes, have you seen them? Uh -uh. They look like socks. Yeah. That's, how uh, thin, yeah. Yeah. that's how thin they make the sole because you want to be flat and low to the ground. Yeah. So yeah, don't wear yeah. anything with a heel rise if you're deadlifting. I, I work out in my garage. That's when I go barefoot. I take off my shoes, uh, flat to the floor. Barefoot is liberating. I mean, you got to work your way there, but it's definitely a whole other experience. Absolutely. Look, Mind Pump is recorded on video too. Come check us out on YouTube, Mind Pump Podcast. 
You can also find all of us on Instagram, including Doug, the producer. You can find Doug at Mind Pump Doug, Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Great job at improving your, your, your sex, not just through feeling better, but also the drive to have sex. If you feel like you have less motivation to have sex, exercise tends to improve that. And your sex drive oftentimes can be a good reflection of your health. When mm -hmm. that drops, oftentimes there's a lot of things underlying the reason why it went down.